Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. I am so pleased and honored to have Dr. Tony Sicoria on the show today. Dr. Sicoria is a renowned orthopedic surgeon with a really busy practice, working 10 to 12 hours a day, who had no interest, time, or talent for music until he was tragically struck by lightning in 1994. The bolt was enough to kill him, but he was soon resuscitated after having a powerful near-death experience. Soon after his MDE, Dr. Sicoria developed a sudden craving for listening to classical piano. So today I am so excited to have Tony and um, we're going, this is going to be two episodes and the first episode he's going to talk about his profound and very unusual near-death experience and the next week we're going to dive into this passion for music and and all about that. So welcome to the program. Thank you. So could you tell us a little bit about um, what happened? Sure. Um, It was August 24th, I think it was, 1994, and we were having a a large birthday party at a place called Sleepy Hollow Lake, which is in Athens, New York, just below Albany, the capital. And we were at a a lakeside pavilion, and there were about 25 members of the family there, um, adults and children, and the party was up on the second floor, and I happened to be out on the ground floor uh, running the barbecue. And the morning started out, it was a beautiful day, and I wasn't paying attention because I was paying attention to the grill. And at some point, I had come to the thought that I needed to give my mom a call. She was not there and just to check on her. And so I got my brother-in-law to cover the barbecue and I started to walk away and I felt a couple of raindrops and I, and I looked out over the lake and I saw that well, there were some clouds and I just kind of ignored it. I walked around the front of the building to where there was a payphone attached to the building and I tried to call my mom and I let it ring five or six times and she did not answer. And I started to pull the phone away from my face. And as I did, I heard a loud crack and the, the phone I had taken in was about a foot away. And I heard this loud crack and this huge flash of light came flying out of the phone and it hit me in the face and just threw me backwards like a rag doll. And as I was getting thrown backwards, suddenly something very confusing happened. I I had the sensation of moving forwards and it didn't make any sense to me because I I saw exactly what happened. I knew what had, had happened at every millisecond of time. And I knew I was traveling backwards, but now this sensation of moving forwards and And then I was standing there and I was absolutely confused. It didn't make any sense to me. I knew that I'd been hit. I I looked in front of me and the phone is dangling and I'm, I'm standing probably five or six feet away from it. And, and I'm just utterly confused and it didn't make any sense. And all I had was that vague sensation of moving forwards. And just then I hear my mother-in-law screaming and she's at the top of the stairs. I'm at the bottom of the stairs um, because the party was up on the second floor. And all of a sudden she starts running down the stairs towards me. And I thought, okay, this is not good. 
Um, and as she got closer to me, she was not looking at me. She was looking off to her left. And as she got to the bottom of the stairs, she passed right in front of me and she raced to her left. And I, and I just, I turned to see where she was going and I was confronted with myself on the ground. Mm -hmm. And at that point I walked over toward where all the action was and I'm lying on the ground and, and I'm thinking, and the first thought that came to my, my mind was, Oh shit, I'm dead. Wow. And, you know, and then it started to make sense that, you know, that vague sensation of moving forward was me separating from my body. And, and so now I'm standing there, I'm looking at the carcass on the ground and, and I see the lady who was standing behind me waiting to use the phone. She starts to get down to do CPR and my mother-in-law is, is crying and I'm standing there and I'm like, my mind is absolutely racing. And one of the, one of the first things that came to mind was whoever I am, I always am. I'm, I'm standing here and I'm thinking about all the things that are happening. I'm realizing that my consciousness is with me because I'm, I'm thinking exactly, exactly the way I normally would. I'm thinking even in the vernacular that I would think in. And as I'm standing there, I'm, I'm watching all of this going on and, and I'm trying to talk to them. I can hear them and I can see them, but, they can't see or hear me. And I stood there for a number of minutes. And after having had the realization that the consciousness survives with me, I thought, well, there's no point in standing here. I, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to go back upstairs and see if I can see my family. And so I, I turned and walked away and I go toward the stairs and I get to about the third stair and I'm looking down the stairs because I always do that because I don't want to trip and fall. And as I get to about the third stair, I see that my legs are starting to dissolve. And, I, and that kind of struck me as like, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. And as I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form and I was just a ball of energy. And the stairs take a left and go up the second flight and rather than do that I just went right through the wall and when I came out on the other side I was directly over where my wife was sitting on a chair painting children's faces so there were a bunch of kids at this at this party and she was in charge of painting faces and <laughs> and helping to entertain the kids and I passed directly over her and I made a specific note of, of where the kids were and how many there were and where they were standing. And then I was passing diagonally through the room. And when I got out of the, when I went through the roof and was outside, then things really became interesting because I had suddenly felt like I fell into a river of pure positive energy. And it was a bluish white light and it had flow and it reminded me of swimming underground in a crystal clear stream where when you looked up at the sun and the sun was pouring through the water and it had this bright sparkly kind of an appearance, but it was this bluish white light. And, and the thing that was amazing about it is that, it radiated the most intense peace and love that you could ever imagine. And I likened it to a pure positive state. In, in science, there's something called absolute zero, where it's a pure quality of, of state where there's no motion, no molecular motion. And it reminded me of that, that there was absolutely nothing but love in this energy. And, and it had 
the sensation of movement. I could feel the movement of this energy like a, a river flowing. But more than that, as I looked at the things that I could see, I could actually see this energy. And it had almost a sine wave kind of a, a look to the, the energy forms. And, and I remember noting that and thinking, wow, this is something I could measure. <laughs> With your scientific background. Um, but it, it was so overpowering that there was nothing else in it. And I had this sensation of flowing with this energy wherever it was taking me. And I had a, a semblance of a, of a life review. It was more like a collage of high points and low points that just kind of whizzed by and without any particular impact. And at this point, I, I've, I've come to the realization that this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to somebody. Wow. And I, I'm thinking, this is absolutely amazing. And at the point where I've realized that there isn't anything better that could ever happen to anyone, it was like somebody flipped a switch and slam, I was back in this body. And I was pissed. I, I was <laughs> angry. I, I said, I don't want to be here. I, please don't make me come back. I begged, I pleaded. And I, you know, I was talking to God, angels, anybody that would listen. Yeah. I was trying to get them to not make me come back. But, you know, the realization that I was given was, you know, it's not your time and that's just the way it is, not your choice. And I thought, okay, well, here we go. So now I'm, I'm back in this body and it hurt. It hurt like hell. Oh, and, I bet. You know, it, it had entered in my, in my face right in the corner of my mouth and come out my foot. And both places felt like somebody had stuck a hot poker in them. Oh. And I remember laying there and I, I know I'm still unconscious. I can't see anything and I can't move, but I'm back. And seemed, and the CPR had stopped and I was, I'm, I was just laying there and waiting to wake up. And it seemed like a couple of minutes before I actually woke up enough to say something. And then unfortunately and embarrassingly, the, the only thing that came out was I looked at the girl who was stand, kneeling next to me and I wanted to thank her. And the only thing that came out was, it's okay, I'm a doctor. <laughs> and she just kind of laughed and says, well, you weren't. You weren't a minute ago. Yeah. And I, and I thought, well, I'm just going to shut up because nothing's making any sense. Right. And at that point, they, they called the police and they show up and they want to take me to the hospital. And I refused transport. I said, I'm not going to go sit in the emergency room for hours for them to tell me I'm alive. I know that. Right. Um, so wow. I opted to have my family take me home and I could see my family doctor and my neurologist and all of those folks that I knew pretty well. Yes. When, when you were on the other side, is that what you call it or what, what phrase do you use? I, on the other side, is yeah. it's a good phrase because it, one of the things that I was struck by was that it literally is a veil. Um, and when, when I had that sensation of moving forward, nothing else changed. There were no bells and whistles. There was nothing physically changed from where I was. I still saw everything. I, I still heard everything, but I wasn't part of it. And so, and I call it a veil because the veil has just pulled aside and I was someplace else. Um, yeah. Whereas that someplace else was I in another dimension? Um, I would have to assume that that phase change is nothing more than a, a change in dimension. Right. And that it exists right here. When I was on the other side, the thing that I was struck by was the absolute love and peace 
um, the energy that pervaded everything. And, and one of the realizations that I, that I made at that time was that whatever this energy was, this was what made up everything that we see and know. And, and I thought, well, if this, if this force is God, then I understand. Right. Were you scared at all at any point when it first started or when you came to the realization that, that you were dead? Was it scary for you? No, actually it wasn't scary. It was a shock because I guess I expected there to be something that would tell me that, that, that I had died. Right. Right. But it, it, it didn't, it was just, there was that, that very subtle sensation of moving out of the body yeah. and then nothing else was different. And so if, if there was anything that I could say that I was, it was mystified. Yes. So when you um, came back and just being an orthopedic surgeon and a scientist, and, and a PhD in philosophy, is that right? It's in physiology and biophysics. Okay, okay. How did you, how did you integrate this and what did you think of it? And what was your, your religion before, if you had one? Had you ever really thought about what would happen when, when someone died? Um, I was brought up as Catholic. Um, and... And this whole experience punched a big hole in my faith um, because the Catholic Church didn't believe in reincarnation, didn't believe in, in a lot of the things that I had just gone through and found out existed. And so I became much less religious and much more spiritual. Um, and so I clearly understood that, um, there was a whole other side to life and that death was just part of this normal transition and that you keep coming back here as the same spiritual person in different clothes each time you come back and the intention of coming back is to grow spiritually and with the ultimate hope of being able to join the source which doesn't there's no guarantee that you get to do that uh, right. you have to prove yourself um, in whatever way they use to to do that but uh, from everything that i've read and come to understand this the there's a spiritual evolution that we all have to go through um, mm -hmm. and we don't get to take any shortcuts and we build our spiritual mess on each time we're here and eventually we graduate to a point where we don't have to keep doing this so wow. and this happened in 1994 is that when this happened yeah. 1994 and you still talk about it so clearly and is it something that's just so vividly stayed stayed with you absolutely there it's it's been amazing that there's never been any part of it that has changed and mm -hmm. it's i remember it exactly as it happened like it was yesterday Right. So how did this, and we're, we're going to talk about your, your music, of course, because that's huge in terms of how it changed you. But I know you said that you um, felt as if you, you were kind of, re, if I understood, reincarnated from that kind of doctor science life to what you came back as that even that was some sort of a reincarnation, there was such a change. Can you tell us how did you, how did Dr. Tony Sicoria change with people professionally, that sort of thing? Um, at, before the lightning, 
I was driven toward uh, medicine and publishing articles and doing research. And that was the way I had been brought up educationally. And I was the chairman of spine meetings and I was involved in all kinds of things, but, and I was being groomed to, to go into that life. And suddenly none of that mattered. And it took me about a week, a week and a half before I thought clearly enough that I could go back to work. And then it was like nothing had ever happened except that I didn't feel the same. And the, the things that were important now that weren't so important before was the way people felt, the things that, that I experienced with interacting with people, and there, the, the scientific um, way I looked at things had changed. I realized that, you know, there's not, there are not any hard, fast rules about all of these things that, I, that I've seen. And in fact, there's no real explanation. And at the time, you know, in the, in the mid nineties, this wasn't even okay to think about. Right. And if, if I had gone around in my hospital and started talking about all of these things, somebody would have reported me to the state and I would have lost my license. And that was yeah. the kind of atmosphere it was. And, and you had to be somewhat discriminating about who you talk to these things about. Um, so I, for the most part, I was quiet about it. Um, you know, my, my family and, and friends were the only ones that I had mentioned much to in my doctors who knew about it. And I didn't, I didn't talk about it much. Um, that came much later um, when my friend Oliver Sachs kind of let the cat out of the bag. Yes. I think this is a great place to wrap it up for today. And Tony, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. And I'm so excited to have you back next week to talk more about your beautiful music. And if any of my listeners would like to reach Tony, he can be reached at T Sicoria, C I C O R I A, at yahoo.com. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us at interviewswithinnocence.com and on Facebook or Instagram at Interviews with Innocence. Please write me a message. Tell me what you liked and let me know what else you would like to hear. I would love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating and review. It helps other listeners find the show. Thank you.